The saying, it's not perfect, but it's all we have, could apply perhaps to a car or a house. However, unfortunately, it also applies to our judicial system. There really is no honor among thieves. From drug dealers to burglars, many children in the San Antonio Barrio grew up in rough terrains. Learning the ways of being a criminal were in the books of many. A home in the neighborhood block had been under construction and due to the rampant reports of burglaries, two workmen took extra precaution to protect their belongings by sleeping on mattresses on the floor inside of the home. As they slept that fateful evening on November 8, 1984, 15-year-old David Garza and his alleged accomplice, 17-year-old Ruben Cantu, broke into the vacant house. Carrying rifles, the teen held the workmen at gunpoint, stealing the wristwatches from both victims. In order to defend himself, the first construction worker, Pedro Gomez, reached underneath his mattress to grab his pistol, but to no avail, as one of the boys shot Pedro nine times, resulting in his instant death. With a robbery gone wrong, the boys shot the second victim, Juan Moreno, several times, attempting to kill him and leaving no suspects behind. Assuming they killed both men, the teens fled the scene, but failed to realize that the second workman survived the assault. Despite his severe wounds, Juan was able to call for help and made it to the hospital, barely surviving the ordeal. Officers asked Juan on four separate occasions to help identify the shooter. However, due to the shock he endured, he had a difficult time offering a description. David Garza was sent in for questioning prior to his arrest and insisted that his friend Ruben was responsible for murdering the worker. With little to go on, the case went cold until Ruben resurfaced on police radars after shooting an off-duty police officer at a local lounge near nearly four months after the burglary. Ruben claimed he had been threatened by the officer, resulting in the altercation. Officer Joe Delalue survived and had his friend and fellow officer Sergeant Ewell reopen the previous case against Ruben. After many attempts, Sergeant Ewell brought Juan Moreno in for identifying the murderer. This time, Juan finally identified Ruben as the killer. Ruben was convicted of first-degree murder. In desperation, Ruben wrote a note to the people of San Antonio stating, I have been framed in a cap murder case. I was framed because I shot an off-duty police officer. On August 24th, 1993, at 12.22 a.m., Ruben died by lethal injection at the age of 26, becoming the fifth juvenile offender to be executed in Texas. Ruben's final request was a piece of bubblegum, which was denied. When asked if he had a final statement, Ruben simply said, no, sir. Years after Ruben's death, his friend, David Garza, admitted that he himself was involved in robbing the workmen, but instead, a school friend had been his partner during the assault. Ruben was never at the scene that evening. Sir Surviving construction worker Juan Moreno later stated that he identified Ruben as the killer in order to steer clear of law enforcement as he had been an illegal immigrant at the time and feared for his future. Ruben Cantu lost his life as the result of being included in a story he was never a part of at all. Guilt by association can sometimes simply apply to being in the same family. On September 29, 1981, public safety officer David Rucker was shot and killed along a highway just a few miles away from Brownsville, Texas. Moments passed before a driver located the officer's lifeless body alongside his police cruiser. A social security card belonging to a man named Leonel Torres Herrera had also been discovered at the scene, making whoever Leonel was a prime suspect. Los Fresnos officer Enrique Carasales was on a chase to stop a speeding vehicle near the scene. Once successfully pulling over, the driver opened his door and exchanged a few words with Officer Carasales before shooting him in the chest. The license plate belonging to the shooter was also tied to Leonel, as the vehicle was registered under his girlfriend's name and was a car that he was frequently seen driving. Officer Carasales managed to survive an intensive care and successfully identified a single photo of Leonel as his shooter before passing away nine days later from his sustained injuries. Leonel Herrera was promptly arrested and was tried for the murder of both Officer Rucker and Carasales. 
With enough evidence pinned against him, the jury found Leonel guilty of capital murder, sentencing him to death. Seeking justice against his conviction, Leonel filed a petition for habeas corpus providing new evidence that would potentially aid him in proving his innocence for both murders. Attorney Hector Villarreal, who represented Leonel's brother Raul in a case years before, and Juan Palacios, a former cellmate of Raul's, both included affidavits to Leonel's petition stating that Raul told both men that he murdered the officers. Raul himself was murdered in 1984. Leonel believed that the execution of an innocent man would constitute cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment. After much debate, Leonel's defense could not help prove his innocence. Leonel Herrera's final words were, I am innocent, innocent, innocent. Make no mistake about this. I owe society nothing. Continue the struggle for human rights, helping those who are innocent. I am an innocent man and something very wrong is taking place tonight. May God bless you all. I am ready. Leonel was executed by lethal injection on May 15, 1993. Desperation combined with bribery can lead to certain death. On July 13, 1982, two fishermen spotted the bodies of three mangled teenagers in Spiegelville Park near Lake Waco, Texas. The teens were identified as Jill Montgomery, Raylene Rice, and Kenneth Franks, who had all been stabbed multiple times. Both females had each of their throats slashed and had signs of sexual assault, while Kenneth was found tied to a tree wearing sunglasses. Investigators arrested Mundir Deeb, a convenience store worker, and David Wayne Spence in connection to the murders. With little physical evidence, prosecutors used teeth marks and testimony from David's fellow inmates as primary evidence to convict David. Mundir had allegedly paid David and two additional men, Gilbert and Anthony Melendez, to murder an employee in order to collect insurance, but they accidentally killed the wrong girl and had no other choice but to murder her friends as well. David was already serving a 90-year sentence for aggravated sexual abuse of an 18-year-old male when he was tried for the slayings. After a decade-long trial, Mundir was acquitted and both men maintained their innocence, while both Melendez brothers pled guilty. While on death row, David's mother, Juanita White, received a letter from one of the inmates who testified against David. The inmate profusely apologized for their testimony, claiming that they lied on the stand after being bribed to testify against David. Juanita, excited, turned the letter over to David's lawyer. 48 hours later, she was found raped and beaten to death in her home. And these circumstances didn't stop the death sentence. David Spence was executed by lethal injection on April 3rd, 1997. His final words included, First of all, I want you to understand I speak the truth when I say I didn't kill your kids. Honestly, I have not killed anyone. I wish you could get the rage from your hearts and could see the truth and get rid of the hatred. Other prison inmates later admitted that they had been bribed with additional visiting hours, food, and cigarettes in order to fabricate their testimonies against David Spence. For some officers, committing the crime isn't necessary when it comes to paying for it. It was the early morning on May 23, 1981, when shots were fired in Jacksonville, Florida. Officers were called to Highway 95 after Officer Thomas Zafransky was found shot in the head with a bullet police determined to be from a 30-30 rifle. Within a matter of minutes, officers searched the nearest apartment building and in no time decided to arrest Leo James for the murder after discovering two Winchester rifles hidden underneath his bed. A mere 12 hours after his arrest, Leo confessed to killing Officer Zafransky, but later admitted that he was pressured to confess after officers began beating him and threatening his life by placing a gun to his head. Previous run-ins with police made Leo no stranger to law enforcement, making his motive a possible revenge kill against officers. Despite additional appeals, witness testimonies, and potential suspects, Leo's execution was settled. Leo Alexander Jones was executed by electrocution on March 24, 1998. Once you've made an assumption, it could very well be too late to take it back. On June 26, 1980, 19-year-old drug dealer Quinton Moss was shot and killed in the city of St. Louis, Missouri. Approximately 13 rounds had entered his body, instantly killing him. Eyewitnesses were able to identify Larry Griffin as the main suspect in the drive-by shooting after looking through an array of police photos and noting the same vehicle spotted at the scene. Just six months prior, Larry's brother, Dennis Griffin, a well-known drug dealer, had been murdered, linking Quinton to the crime. This gave officers the idea that Larry was seeking 
seeking out revenge for his brother, a witness account had later come forward by a man named Robert Fitzgerald, who clearly identified Larry as the shooter. Since Robert himself was a convicted felon that had many previous run-ins with law enforcement, it was unsure just how legitimate his statements would be. Robert became unsure of his own story over time, recanting his statements. During the trial, Robert wasn't so sure if officers had the right guy in their possession after all. Two additional witnesses wanted to testify and aid Larry in proving his innocence, but were never contacted by prosecutors. With zero physical evidence securely tying Larry to the drive-by, Larry continued to proclaim his innocence until the day of his execution. Larry Griffin was executed by lethal injection on June 21st, 1995. You'd think that overwhelming evidence that you're innocent could get you out of trouble, but it doesn't do very much good if no one sees it. Ellis Wayne Felker was convicted for the 1981 disappearance of Evelyn Joy Ludlam. Evelyn had been a college student attending Macon Junior College and was a student that struggled to survive off her salary as a cocktail waitress. It seemed as if her luck had changed when she was promised a job at a leather shop belonging to Ellis Felker. Police in Georgia soon uncovered the remains of Evelyn in Scuffle Creek in the early morning of December 8, 1981. Ellis was immediately placed as the main suspect and was put under police surveillance within hours of her disappearance. An autopsy conducted on the body concluded that Evelyn had been raped, stabbed, and killed. However, controversy surrounded the case as the time of death had been changed a number of times. The original time of death concluded that Evelyn had died five days prior. When police realized this would have ruled out Ellis as a suspect, the findings of the autopsy autopsy were changed. Independent autopsies found that the victim had been dead no longer than three days. In September 1996, Ellis's attorneys received boxes of evidence that had been unlawfully withheld by the prosecution, containing large amounts of evidence suggesting that Ellis was indeed an innocent man. Despite the amount of evidence and doubts of Ellis being a killer, the Supreme Court of Georgia denied a new trial. Ellis Felker was executed for the murder of Evelyn Ludlam on November 13, 1996. Despicable to think that the color of your skin alone can determine whether you live or die. Lena Baker was an African-American mother of three who supported her family by working as a maid for Ernest Knight in 1944. The professional relationship between Lena and Ernest was non-existent, as Lena reported that Ernest would lock her away for days at a time, threatening that she couldn't leave his property. Lena feared her boss due to his controlling and abusive behavior towards her. On one particular evening, Ernest threatened Lena with an iron bar. To protect herself during their altercation, Lena shot Ernest with his gun, killing him in his home. Lena was soon charged with capital murder and stood trial for the crime on August 14, 1944. Racial segregation was prominent during this time in Georgia. An all-white jury convicted and sentenced Lena that same afternoon. Lena maintained her innocence and was executed by the electric chair on March 5, 1945 in Reedsville, Georgia. She was the only woman in Georgia to have been executed by electrocution. Wrong place, wrong time. Carlos de Luna was executed on December 7, 1989 for the 1983 stabbing of Wanda Lopez, a woman who worked as a gas store clerk for Shamrock Gas Station in Corpus Christi, Texas. Moments prior to the murder, George Aguirre was filling up his gas tank when he noticed a man standing outside of the store with a knife on him. The man approached Kevin and asked if he could drive him to the casino club, a local bar. Nervous, Kevin declined and made his way into the store, paying for his gas and alerting the cashier of the man. An additional eyewitness had been at the scene, attempting to stop Wanda's bleeding after the man had attacked her. Police were able to find a man a few blocks away from the gas station. Despite it being a cold February evening, police found Carlos de Luna shirtless and shoeless in a puddle of water. With such a bloody crime scene, it was baffling to see that no blood had been found on Carlos. However, his odd behavior led police to believe that he was the gas station attacker. Forensic tests indicated that no physical evidence tied Carlos to the murder. When questioned by psychiatrists, Carlos simply stated that he had no recollection of his arrest, believing he had total amnesia that evening. During his trial, Carlos stated that he had gone out drinking to a bar with an old childhood friend. His friend instructed him that he needed to go to the gas station and would return for more drinks. Time passed, and in concern, Carlos eventually walked towards the gas station, only to see Wanda being attacked. Carlos continuously told prosecutors that he was innocent, until the day of his execution. 
It's a little known fact that what we refer to as forensic science isn't quite as dependable as we'd like to think. Cameron Todd Willingham was convicted of murdering his three young daughters by intentionally setting his house on fire in Corsicana, Texas on December 23, 1991. Cameron's wife had not been at the home during the incident and had been out shopping. Cameron managed to survive the fire with minor burns to his body. Prosecutors believe that Cameron purposely set the family house on fire in order to cover up any abuse he had done to his daughters. However, his wife struck down the allegations, stating that he spoiled his children rotten and never showed any signs of abuse. Controversy surrounded the case due to evidence found at the scene indicating that the fire was purposely lit on the family's front porch, the children's bedrooms, and in the hallways. Investigators had determined that the fire was deliberately set with the help of a liquid accelerant due to specific burn patterns found at the scene. Cameron was deemed an extremely severe sociopath by psychiatrists after finding Iron Maiden and Led Zeppelin posters in his house indicating the father's fascination with death. Cameron repeatedly proclaimed his innocence until the day of his execution by lethal injection on February 17, 2004. A re-examination of the case was made in 2009 and since then the Texas Forensic Commission panel has stated that there had been uses of flawed science in the case, seeing as the original investigators relied on outdated theories to justify their conviction. You really need to be very careful with who you associate with. Officers Philip Black and Donald Irwin had been patrolling on the early morning of February 20th, 1976, when they noticed a car parked at a nearby rest stop. Inside the vehicle was Jesse Taffaro, his partner Sonia Sonny Jacobs, her two young children, and Walter Rhodes. Officers instantly noticed that a gun had been lying on the floor of the vehicle. With no choice, officers knocked on the vehicle door, instructing Jesse and Walter to exit the car. According to Walter, once the two men exited the car, Jesse drew out the gun and shot both officers, killing them instantly. Jesse then led everyone into the police vehicle and drove off. Once disposing the vehicle, Jesse allegedly kidnapped a man and stole his car. It wasn't long before police were able to stop the group and arrest all three adults at a roadblock. Jesse had previously been released from prison and was on probation prior to the arrest. Because of his testimony against Jesse, Walter got off with a reduced sentence of second-degree murder, while Jesse and Sonia were convicted of capital murder and were sentenced to death. Jesse was executed on May 4, 1990 by electrocution in an electric chair dubbed Old Sparky. While in the process of his electrocution, Old Sparky malfunctioned, causing six-inch flames to shoot out of Jesse's head, making his final moments torturous as the electrocution lasted about seven minutes, a slow and painful death. Inmates stated that the chair was purposely fixed in order for Jesse to suffer at a greater impact. Walter later confessed to the murders of both officers after Jesse's execution, but did not receive any additional jail time for his actions. Sonia's death sentence was overturned in 1981, and she was sentenced to life with a 25-year mandatory sentence. That's all for now. What do you think? Were these people guilty or innocent? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. And also, if you'd like to continue your hunt for the dark, please be sure to check out my episode on the eerie found footage in the Paris catacombs. You can either click on screen now or in the description below to watch that. And of course, if you'd like to learn more dark and disturbing topics, please be sure to subscribe to my channel now. And I will see you next Wednesday.